Okay, well, welcome to part two of this um, fascinating article um, on the history of the pastoral pipes. Um, it's by it's by Hugh Cheap. Uh, this is part two, so obviously please listen to part one because you're just after missing an hour. I'm going to do this. It this is a really good long article. I have a feeling it could actually take me about three hours to read it out. Or four hours, but it's so it's it's well worth doing, and there's so much in it that um, I've no problem going through it. I think it's I'm finding it fascinating, so I'm gonna split it up into sort of hour long parts. So you're on part two now. So obviously, listen to part one first. So this is part two. Um, he's delving into here um, relative to the pastoral pipe, bagpipe, um, the repertoire of tunes that was in it um in when he's mentioning um John Gagan's um John Gagan's book um the complete tutor for the past oral or new bagpipe um circa 1746 so he's just kind of describing this and what's in it and um several of the song titles so just if you just to finish up there on part one, um, we finished up with um the tune uh, the Battle of Ockram, which I was intrigued to find out that it could have been um, 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 a residual form of a pibroch, uh, f f uh, surviving in Ireland, um, from the heroic kind of bardic tradition. Um, I wasn't expecting to come across something like that at all, but then the more I thought about it. Um, the Battle of Ockram was in 1691 and Gagan's thing was published in 1746. So it's really kind of only 50 years in between. You do forget that, like, just, you do kind of forget the, the space of time that, you know, this kind of Pibroch would have actually might have survived from those times. Um, although... The version I came across there wasn't played as a P block. It was a much it was like a faster tune, kind of like a bit like a march, kind of speeded up or whatever. So anyway, um, I'm just going through some of the of the tunes that he's already suggested. Um, particularly I'm interested in the ones that are in the Irish tradition and the Scot Scottish uh, tradition. So um, there was a one he mentioned called um. He says uh. He says, Irish naming in tunes is exceptional and tunes may have been chosen as subliminal or oblique signatures by the author. Tunes such, tunes such as The Humours of Westmead and Castle Bar. So I've been digging out there for a bit and I came across one version of The Humours of Westmead, but it sounded really weird. Um, so then I just came across a second version of it and... It, it seems to me to be the same tune, except there's a slightly different name. It's the Rakes of Westmead. So here's just a little bit about, uh, here's just a little example of that. Um, this one is being played by um, Michal O'Halwan. Uh, and uh, I think Steve Cooney's on the background uh, on the guitar, but it's just a, um, a, a very brief um this one is it's called the the rakes of Westmead, as I say, but I did come across one called the humours of rest of West Westmead, and they seem to be the same tune, but this is a much uh, better version. So here goes the rakes of Westmead. <laughs>
Yeah, so just just to give you a flavour of what's uh, in Geigen's um, uh, book, um, he mentions another one here that says, uh, um, or be familiar as Scottish song airs such as Tweed Side. So I, f I found a lovely version of this uh, Tweed Side here. Um, it's... Um, this was from Joshua Jackson's uh, book of 1798, uh, Tunes and Songs. Uh, it's from an album called um, A Trip to Harrogate. So here's a little bit of the tune, uh, Tweed Side. It just adds, it, it's a particularly nice, it's a very nice air. So that was the sound of a uh, tweed side. Um, now he does mention another one, um, the, the last of Levenstone, but I couldn't find, um, I couldn't find that one. Right, so then he, he goes on to uh, mention another tune here, um, the modal jig called Whipper and Girder, right, unfortunately named. Um, so this is it. This is um this is a friend of mine called uh, Jeremy um Kingsbury and he has his own uh he has his own YouTube channel and if I think of it I'll put the link down below here as well. Um this lad is amazing. Um I'd recommend his channel to everybody here that's listening to this article. Just YouTube Jeremy Kingsbury J E R E M Y and then K I N G S B U R Y Jeremy Kingsbury because what, what this chap does is he just completely specializes in pipe tunes from mostly the 1700s and um, some a little bit earlier some a little bit later but tunes from the 1700s and, and he plays them on illin pipes Scottish small pipes border pipes his big bag pipes the whole lot um, he goes back to original manuscripts this lad is just amazing he's the only one I know that does this 
he just digs out all these obscure manuscripts from the 1700s and especially like pipe tunes and everything like that and then he plays them for us he, he studies them and then he plays them for us so if you're anything like me and you can't read music um this chap and his channel are completely invaluable so um this is jeremy anyway playing the uh, unfortunately named uh, song whip whipper and geared her and this is from gagan's collection All right, so I'll carry on with the article anyway. Um, well, clearly assembling a repertoire for the pastoral pipe, Gagan seems also to want to define a repertoire and to define a repertoire that draws strongly on Irish tradition. If this is music for the new bagpipe, it has potential for dramatic and theatrical performance while bridging the old and the new and giving Ireland a locus in the rapidly changing world of contemporary 18th century music and public performance. I think that's very well put. Anyhow, um, a diagnostic and probably unique feature of this copy of Gagan's Complete Tutor is an 11 page additional section entirely in manuscript, almost certainly all written by the same hand. The section includes 15 tunes and it is, suggest, it is suggested was compiled and written in Scotland or by a Scot and must represent a personal repertoire. The printed tune Blind Paddy's Fancy, for example, has the title Had the Lass Till I Win At Her added in manuscript in the same hand as the closing section, neatly er illustrating how the music naturally crossed national boundaries and the tunes came to be widely recognised and remembered and differently branded with their respective regional or national names. Now, I couldn't find uh, a version of that. Look, look, I'm just sitting here on YouTube and I'm doing sort of searches, um, but I don't want to really be taken up all day with, with the with the music repertoire of the tunes, I don't mind just giving a bit of a, a flavour or a measure of what sort of tunes they were listening to, especially if they're pipe tunes, but the, the whole idea of this is to find out about the instrument itself, not so much um, 
what was played on it. Although it is nice to hear some tunes that kind of, I don't know, stand out a bit or whatever, just to give a flavour of what it was. But I'm not going to labour over finding everything. Um, again, that chap I mentioned, Jeremy Kingsbury, if you want to listen to tunes from the 1700s, go straight to his channel. There's any amount of them there. So I'll just carry on with the article. Um, compared with the Dixon manuscript of pipe music from the same period, the genre of dance and song tunes and their settings are comparable, but hint at quite distinctive regional affiliations. Only Pinky House, named for a mansion in Midlothian, gives any local reference here. The first tune in the additional section, The Maid That's Made for Love and Me, has words of verse and chorus added, for example, with a closing line of such typical early 18th century pecuancy, what kind of nymph the heavens decree, the maid that's made for love and me. The holograph selection includes inter alia clout the cauldron, the flagon, she rose and let me in, through the wood laddie, the yellow-haired laddie, my mother's eye glowering o'er me, and Bessie Bell and Mary Gray, a ballad or folk song claimed for late 17th century Perthshire. A further multi-parted version of the 6-8 rhythm Whipper and Gerter is included, in this instance qualified as for a great pipe. The parts of this latter tune written down here in manuscript may represent the earliest recorded piece of music for the great Highland bagpipe. Further research may suggest that written here in G in common with one or two others in the manuscript section, this extended version of Whipper and Gerter with characteristic runs of semi quavers was either recorded from all or alternatively adapted for the Highland instrument. The latter interpretation would seem more probable, except that uniquely in the manuscript, the author has introduced a shorthand indicator of GR under quaver and semi-quaver groupings. This may be taken for graces as discussed by Gagan earlier in the tutor. Right, so I just found one or two of those um, aforements and tunes that I did kind of like the sound of. I won't play them all, just to give you a flavour of it. So here's the one called Clout the Cauldron. Hold on a second. Sorry, my mistake. This is Clout the Cauldron here. And that goes on and then here's here's the other one called the flagon this is on the pipes this is the flagon
and here's um, a piece of uh, She Rose and Let Me In. And here's a piece of the yellow haired laddie. There's a kind of a peculiar one there as well that he mentioned just before, um, Betsy Bell and Mary Gray. Um, I think it's one of these kind of child ballads, like rhymes. Um, it sounds an awful lot older though than something from the 1700s. So I'll just play a little bit of it here. Um, I, like, I like peculiar, quirky sort of songs and tunes, so this sort of falls right into it. Um, just give you a little flavour for that. Betsy Bell and Mary Gray. Betsy Bell and Mary they were bonny lasses They built them a bar on young burn's side They think it all the holy rushes They think it all the holy rushes Green, they think it all the holy heather The play come from the bottom town And slew them both And here's another version of that which I thought was amazing. And um, this is by a bit, little bit from um, Steeloy Span. Um, that beautiful fiddle music coming into it. Just give you a little taste of that. It's the same song, just it's different um, people uh, singing it. It's, it's song certainly I'm going to look into a bit more.
yeah, it's a plague song. Um. Anyway, I'll just carry, I'll, I'll I'll carry on with the with the article. As you can see, there's a really broad range of tunes and kinds of songs in that. Like really interesting. I'm glad now actually that I did go through it and wasn't going to, but um, they were some of the best ones that I could find in that list. Um. You know. Anyway, here we go. Um. A further multi-parted version of the 6-8 rhythm, Whipper and Gerd Heard is included. Yeah, in this instance, qualified for the Great Pipe. Oh, sorry, I read that bit. Um, okay. Yeah, or organological beginnings. In setting benchmarks in the material culture for a clearer picture and understanding of the pastoral pipe, a set of pipes in the Duncan Fraser collection in the National Museum of Scotland offers vital organological evidence. That's a new word for me, organological. This set seems to accord closely with Gagan's description of the pastoral pipe. Writing at the turn of the 20th century, these pipes were described by Dr. Fraser significantly as old Irish bagpipes. Although no provenance is given, they are made from dark brown hardwood, possibly one or two different species, and are bone and horn mounted. They have a long flat chanter with a foot joint, possibly of fruit wood, with an overall length of 20 inches, and two sound holes, and a reed seat at, of 6 mil narrowing to the throat and a bar diameter expanding to 13 mil at the tenon joint and 16 mil at the chanter mouth or the bell. The two drones are tenor and folded or looped base. The shortened base is achieved by a return section of two pipes modelled as a pair of treble drones discreetly linked by a smaller connecting pipe between the drawn tops. This set was bellows blown according to the low placing of the blowpipe in the skin of the bag and its cylindrical connecting pipe style, although the bellows are missing. Exceptionally, the skin bag has survived the skin bag that has survived may be original. Um, it is sealed along the seam with a generous wealth and may in time tell us more about the pressure used for inflating the pipes and overblowing technique and about characteristics of the three reeds used in the early pastoral pipe. Closer examination also may reveal residues suggesting how the bag might have been seasoned. The style and finish of the set, particularly the chanter, drone tops and modest beading on the common stock suggest that this set was made, if not in London, in Scotland, probably in Edinburgh or one of the East Coast boroughs in the early mid to 18th century. Another set, possibly of a slighter later date, judging by the more lavish use of ivory for mounts and ferrules, is illustrated by Grattan Flood in 1911 and described by him curiously in the caption as set of bagpipes, probably old Northumbrian, and a set of Northumbrian pipes in the list of illustrations. Given the author's claims for Irish origins for pipes and piping, and his ready attribution of an illin pipe pedigree, it is immediately surprising to the students of this subject that he has not associated this instrument with the illin pipes. Alternatively, Grattan Flood's term reflects a contemporary awareness of the survival of the union pipe in England, and for which he would still draw a distinction. This is a two-drawn set, the base lengthened by a return section with a chanter and foot joint entirely in the model of the 18th century pastoral pipe and probably to be associated with the workshops of London or Edinburgh, although the finish 
of the drone tops in a lotus column style could suggest an Edinburgh source. It is now preserved in the collections of the National Museum of Ireland. Now, Restoration England and Scotland. Contemporary English musical life helps to explain the evolution of the pastoral pipe more readily than in Scottish or Irish musical life in the first instance. In 1642, stage plays such as the courtly masks, an elite form of musical entertainment since the late 16th century, had been prohibited and musicals and drama continues to be illegal during the Commonwealth. The restoration of the monarchy in 1660 was followed by a removal of the ban on the theatre and a fresh emphasis on social skills such as making music, singing and dancing. Musicians, players and actors, tumblers and other entertainers who had been unemployable in London for about a quarter of a century reappeared from country retreats where they had been eking out livelihoods in other trades or living under the patronage of those sympathetic families who continued to stage private musicals and drama. That a musical culture was maintained is suggested by the appearance of the first by the appearance of the first three editions of John Playford's The English Dancing Master during the Commonwealth beginning in 1651. His 105 tunes include one or two recognisable as Scottish, such as The Broom of Cowden Nells. So here's a little bit of that, The Broom of Cowden Nells. Right, so that's a bit of the broom of Cowden Nells. And anyway, about that song, it goes on to say, um, Popular entertainment then returned to the capital. In this context, high and low art or serious and light music, as we could tend to perceive them, were far from mutually exclusive. Routes between church, court and alehouse were not prescribed and seemed to have been followed by most. The serious and the profane in music were equally enjoyed and performed, and composers such as Henry Purcell, 1659 to 1695, successively, um, successively organist at Westminster Abbey and the Chapel Royal, wrote music for the court and church, as well as for the theatre and the body vernacular in song. Ideals of Baroque music were that it should be eloquent and expressive in order to affect mood and convey emotion. But there were also strong and popular exotic and scatological veins, and audiences also expected and looked for a range of musical allegory and symbolism. And I think that was kind of clearly shown there in the that kind of selection of music I've just played um 
so far. Like uh, there's quite a, a a broad range of kind of types of songs there, um and and you will read on and uh, an audience is also expected and looked for a range of musical allegory and symbolism. Clearly, different instruments or combinations of instruments could be the vehicles for symbolic meaning, so that, for example, the lascivious lute identified by playwrights since Shakespeare as the instrument of seduction could introduce a libidinous note. The bagpipe was regarded as a pastoral instrument for reproducing the music of the countryside and what could be classed as the songs of shepherds. As the instrument of the god Pan it could also represent the profane as against the sacred of stringed instruments. Hogarth's representation of uncouth music making in an engraving of 1726 for Samuel Butler's Hudibras included the bagpipe. Its sound was also thought expressive of a primitive social and rural harmony. Arcadia could be evoked by composers developed being motifs associated with the pipes, as was achieved by Italian composers such as Arcangelo Corelli, who lived from 1653 to 1713, or imitating or even using bagpipes in classical performance. In France in the late 17th century, enthusiasm in court culture for the pastoral is linked to the pastoral operas by the great Jean-Baptiste Lully and Jean-Philippe Rameau, who used bass notes to recreate a drone effect of the musette. It was therefore entirely apt to recreate a pastoral instrument that was a bagpipe. I think that's really interesting there. The way it says, um, the bagpipe was regarded as a pastoral instrument for reproducing the music of the countryside and what could be classed as the songs of shepherds. Um, and yeah, that real kind of getting real down to the gritty sort of the way I've said this before in some videos, the way you see these all kind of sketches and woodcuts, whereas sometimes it's associated with evil. And it says here, the instruments of the god Pan it could represent the profane as against the sacred of the stringed instruments. So yeah, the pipes are pan and that sort of stuff. Sort of, you do see devils dancing about with, with bagpipes and things like that. Um, as the profane against string sort of heavenly harps and things like that. But also, you know, prior to that as well, pipes were, were used in church music for religious music as well. I've covered that a lot before. Um, so I think it's interesting, yeah, um, it says it is therefore entirely apt to recreate, recreate a pastoral instrument that was a bagpipe. The move of the court to London in 1603 and the civil and religious wars in the 17th century are given as reasons why Scotland had little or no classical music of its own. The labels cultural desert and cultural stagnation have been applied. The courtly tr tradition of music making, singing and dancing had given form to taste and patronage and its earlier strength and pervasiveness can be gauged by what remained such as keyboard and lute manuscripts as it waned in the 17th century. A further argument has been proposed that covenanting theology and Presbyterian discipline worked to eliminate frivolous music making. Many in Scotland could denounce restoration culture, not, quote, nothing to be seen but debauch and reveling, unquote, or quote, novel and superfluous pomp, or as much drinking and carousing as in former times. Certainly Protestant reformers of the late 16th century expressed their disapproval of the courtly and Italianate tradition in, in the strongest terms, recalled in and symbolised neatly perhaps by the short-lived career of David Riccio, 
um, a secretary of Mary Queen of Scots. They also turned their attention to popular music making, largely as a manifestation of the pre-Reformation ecclesiastical and political regime. That's very interesting. I never thought of that before either. That that those terrible times in Scotland, like in the sixteen hundreds, known as the Killing Times, it was basically a, it was a basically just unending years of civil war in Scotland, like uh, just between kind of r religious ideologies and and political intrigue, and it was a dreadful time in Scotland called the Killing Times in the sixteen hundreds, and I'm sure the music as this man is saying, must have suffered um, by the more, I don't know, strict kind of puritanical kind of religious people of the time. I believe that's what happened in Wales, um, that the the Welsh have a remnant of a bagpipe to this day, it's still called a pibgorn, and essentially it's a horn pipe, it's a, it's a pipe, it's a reed instrument with two horns, like one used as a mouthpiece and the other as a bell end. But it is reckoned, and I've covered this yet again in other ones of my videos, um, it is re reminiscent of a bagpipe chanter, and it is believed, and they've tried it, they've stuck it into a bag with a drone, and it works perfectly as a chanter. But I've come across somewhere that very strict Protestant reformers in the in in the late 16th century and through the 17th century, like these kind of disapproved of kind of merrymaking and fun and stuff like that, kind of done away with. Um, the bagpipe in in Wales and I never thought of that about about that for Scotland either um, and then it says as well in 1603 the, the court moved to London with the union of the crowns um, King James moved his court to London so then that meant that kind of courtly Scottish life like royal kind of lavish kind of court life had moved to London so I'm sure Scottish mu musicians would have went down with him um, I hadn't thought of any of this. Anyway, um, it says the lively tradition of seasonal festivals mapped on the Roman Catholic Church's calendar of saints days, May Day rituals, street plays and popular balladry was regularly cen censured as an element of the maintenance of civic order and popular control rather than an overall dislike of music making. Protestant Scotland's censure of music is liberally quoted, whereas the context of government and borough ordinances generally reveal intelligible expediency rather than a particular animus against music or dilettantism. Now, London. Rus in Orb or Ruth in Orbe. I never know how to how to pronounce that, but um, essentially what it means is an illusion of countryside created by building a garden. Um, well, created by a building or a garden within a city. It's like um a park within a city, kind of an illusion of countryside, a little bit like a haven in. In in the urban uh, setting. So this is London, Russ in Orb. The young John Clerk of Pennequick, who lived from 1675 to 1755, traveling and sojourning in Vienna, Rome and Leiden, and having music lessons on harpsichord and violin, commented that his homeland was devoid of music. This easy judgment on the legacy of the 17th century bypasses vernacular music making and abrogates the need to search for it in Scotland. Manuscript sources, though few, illustrate consistently that a training in keyboard, strings or voice could still be a desired accomplishment. Daughters of the big house, such as Balcaris and Panmure, often achieved this and recorded their art. John Clerk's stricture cannot realistically have included folk music, for example, orally transmitted music whose vigour apparently dispensed with much need to write it down. 
An interest in Scottish music in England in the closing decades of the century points also to this particular vigour. This has led to the measured and cautious judgment that Scottish music was, in Fisk's words, astonishing in its quality and sometimes in its oh, astonishing in its quantity and sometimes in its quality. Successive editions of Playford's Dancing Master included an increasing quota of Scottish tunes reflecting a dramatic growth in popularity for the genre. Highly suggestive too of this enthusiasm is Henry Playford's collection of original Scotch tunes full of the Highland humours printed in London in 1700 and in 1701. The spelling of whose tune titles suggests that they might have been taken down from word of mouth in the capital. In printed form, therefore, Scottish music was available widely in England and principally in London, where, according to a retrospective comment, an inundation of Scotch songs, so called, appears to have poured upon the town by Tom Dufray and his Grub Street brethren. Evidence from, for example, Alan Ramsey, points to a continuing popularity of folk songs current in the 17th century, being arranged with old and new lyrics as folk music in the earliest published collections. Composers and arrangers such as Henry Purcell and John and Henry Playford adopted and adapted Scottish music for English audiences at concerts and in theatres. If the genuine article might not be av available, they would supply material in the Scots manner. Popular imitation pie pieces such as Within a Mile of Edinburgh Town and Catherine Ogg, composed by English wits, were even said to have to have been then accepted in Scotland as Scottish songs. Under an earlier title, "Twas Within a Forelock of Edinburgh Town, this was one of Henry Purcell's Scottish pieces with words by Thomas Dufray. Such tunes would fit the pipe scale, and Gagan's tutor includes music of this genre, such as the so-called Scotch measures, suggesting a coalescing of music, fashion and instrument. So we just mentioned the uh, two tunes there, Within a Mile of Edinburgh Town and Catron Oak. Give you a little taste of those, Within a Mile of Edinburgh. And here's the other one there that they mentioned, um, Catherine Ogie. Now, I don't know if that's Catherine Og, as in Irish, the word for young Og, or is it supposed to be written down Ogie, O-G-G-I-E, but this is really intriguing. I really like the sound of this one. This is from about 1680, it says...
So like, these are brilliant tunes. Like I, I wish I had been around in these times when the when all this stuff was out. Um. Yeah. So anyway, it says here. It says um. Yeah, such tunes would fit the pipe scale, and Gagan's tutor includes music of this genre, such as the so-called Scotch Scotch measures, suggesting a coalescing of music, fashion, and instrument. London and its cosmopolitan musical life therefore seemed to hold the key to a better understanding of the early history of the pastoral and union pipe. In the Baroque era, London saw the more dramatic blend of the scatological and the pastoral, the popular and the elite, which speculatively gave rise to the pastoral or the new bagpipe. From the early 18th century, London was the destination of musicians, singers, composers, actors and playwrights from England, Scotland and Ireland. It was distinctly cosmopolitan, with European musicians crowding there and Italian opera appealing to the cultured and appearing to eclipse any native tradition. The demand for new music, for theatrical performances, civic celebrations, court entertainments and church services seemed insatiable. insatiable. Symptomatic of this atmosphere and fashion was the arrival of George Friedrich Handel in London in 1710. Well, I just want to say, just, just before we get to, to, to Handel here in 1710, I came across a brilliant um, thing out of uh, Pepys's diary, um, which is from 1667 to 1668. This is a, this is, this is um, a, an entrance in his diary, okay, on Tuesday the 24th of March, 1667 slash 68. Now, if you wonder why that happens, there was, a, there was a period in time where the calendar had to change from the Gregorian calendar to the Julian calendar, or, or the Julian one to the Gregorian one. I forget which, I think we're in the Julian calendar now. No, we're in the Gregorian. I think I had to do with Pope Gregory the Great or something like that. And there was a reluctance, there was a reluctance or something, I believe, from Protestant countries to change to the Gregorian calendar because it was the Catholic one or something, something along those lines. But eventually they realised that they had to, it was to do with the quarter day or, you know, the leap year every four years. So anyway, sometimes in this time, in the 1600s and 1700s, you get this slash, is it this year or is it the following year um, on account of that change in the calendar? Um, so anyway, this is out of Samuel Pepys' diary, right? But this is just, I just found this very interesting. So we're in 1667 slash 1668. And there's a bit where he mentions that, um, where does he go? Um, yeah, he got, he's in London, okay? This is Samuel Pepys. And um, he's talking about, as far as I know, he's talking about uh, horse guards and why like Whitehall and Parliament um, around that area anyway in London and I'll just quote um, he took Lord Brun Lord Brunker and me down to the guards now I assume, I assume that's horse guards because he's talking about London city centre anyway so he, he took this lad Lord Brunker and me down to the guards he and his company being upon the guards today and there he did in a handsome room to that purpose, make us a drink, and did call for his bagpipes, which, with pipes of ebony tipped with silver, he did play beyond anything of that kind that I ever heard in my life, and with great pains he must have obtained it, but with pains that the instrument did not deserve at all, for at its best it is mighty barbarous music. Right, so he obviously didn't like it, but he said, I mean, this is 16, where are we, 1667, and his pipes are made of um, eb ebony, and what was it, silver? Yeah. Um, pipes of eb ebony tipped with silver. Um, no, he did give him the credit, he did say he did play beyond anything of that kind that I ever heard in my life. And with great pains he must have obtained it. So 
you know, he must have went to some lengths to have this instrument made or to get the instrument. But anyhow, yeah, it was made in um, ebony tipped with silver. So that's a really, you know, good quality instrument of a bagpipe from 1667 in London. Um, anyway, we'll continue on with this article. Um, he talks about um, Handel, I believe, George Frederick Handel. Um, coming to London in 1710. And for any of the listeners that don't know either, um, Handel's first ever performance of Messiah um, was done in Dublin. Um, Dublin was also a really happening uh, music scene as well. So, um, yeah, so Handel's Messiah was first performed in Dublin. Um, I believe it's there's a side street that's just down near Christchurch Cathedral. Yeah, I might as well just do this because it's quite important. I, I, I remember coming across this article before about Handel's Messiah and what he was doing in Dublin. And apparently he loved Irish folk music. So this really does kind of tie in with this article. Um, just really quickly, this is out of History Ireland. Um, yeah. Uh, it says here... Um, yeah, Fish, right, Fish Amble Street, that's... That that's next to uh to to Christchurch Cathedral. Yeah, so just a quick uh, a, a brief little look at this. Um, Handel. Uh, it says Handel was in every sense of the word a celebrity. He landed in London in seventeen eleven, after living in Italy and familiarizing himself with every aspect of Italian opera. His timing was impeccable. He arrived. This is London now. He arrived just as the artistic taste for all things Italian was in full flow and the British Parliament had invited an obscure Hanoverian elector for whom he had worked to become their next king. That George Ludwig couldn't speak English was less important than the fact that he was Protestant and that his grandmother had been James I's daughter. With royal, with royal backing, Handel became director of London's Opera House and made the capital's music the rival of Paris and Vienna. He did so by imparting talent, violinists from Germany, horn players from Romania, singers and librettists from Italy. He became an entrepreneur just at a time when this new type of animal was stalking out of London's playhouses and pleasure gardens. So why was Messiah premiered in London? No, in Dub sorry, Dublin. So the Messiah was premiered in, Lon in, in, uh, in Dublin in 1742 it was on the 13th of april 1742 and um, on that date more than 700 people squeezed into a mr neil's music hall on fish amble street a, a venue that could comfortably fit 600 people so there was an extra 100 people squeezed in um, proceeds from the ticket sales totaling almost 400 pound were distributed to the city's three largest charities well, that's nice. The Society for Relieving Prisoners, um, Mercer's Hospital on Stephen Street and the Charitable Infirmary on Inns Quay, um, which, and they all received £127 each at the time. So was, they, they, they gave it to charity. Um, but anyway, uh, it, so that was 1742 in Dublin. And it asks the question here in History Ireland, so why was the Messiah premiered in Dublin? Um, Leiden was, was laden with debt and sick of the harping of the news sheets. He escaped, oh sorry, he accepted an invitation from the Lord Lieutenant, Lord Devonshire, and packed his luggage, the score of a piece of music he had written in 10 weeks of the preceding summer. Handel adored Dublin. He liked the generosity of spirit, the easy openness of the people, and probably the intimacy. Remember that the second city of the empire was only then beginning to spread beyond its medieval origins. And I love this bit. It says, he also loved Ireland's traditional music, spending much time with a music pub publisher on Cork Street, a Mr. Hill. Okay, but 1742 is a little bit later than, than, than this. We're, we're still back in 1710 in London. So it says, symptomatic of this atmosphere and of 
and fashion was the arrival of George Frederick Handel in London in 1710, bringing with him his enthusiasm for the artistic freedom of Italy and for opera in the vernacular. Italian composers came to London as visitors or holders of appointments and produced a stream of operas performed in the theatres such as Haymarket. Public interest in performances was keen and opera singers enjoyed typically excessive, if short-lived, popularity. Effects of such fame might even include caricature by William Hogarth, to whom is attributed wrongly a satirical representation of the beggar's opera, complete with a bagpipe. So yeah, there's this illustration of the beggar's opera and it says the beggar's opera in caricature wrongly attributed to William Hogarth in from 1728, based on an anonymous drawing showing orchestra of bagpipe, dulcimer, hum trum and salt box. The music was drawn from Thomas Dufresne's Wit and Mert and William Thompson's Orpheus Caledonius. The depiction of the piper suggests that the image derives from a print or a secondary source. And again, if you ever see that image of the Beggar's Opera, it is attributed to Hogarth, but this says it, it wasn't him. Um, he's clearly playing um, either a pastoral pipe or some sort of a, well, it looks like it looks like a sort of a, like they all do kind of look like Scottish border pipes or lowland pipes. Um, it's bellows blown and the drones are kind of going over his arm, a bit quite like Gagan's one. So that's from 1728. Um, so professional musicians proliferated and the demand for professional quality instruments matched this trend for public music making. The patronage of nobility and middle classes included the hire of professionals to perform and teach music, song and dancing, and weekly concerts for amateurs were staged in taverns and music rooms. A growing public was drawn to the theatre, although they did not care for the high prices and unintelligible um, arias. A reaction set in against the Metropolitan Vogue for Italian opera and against a dilettant set considered to be its chief patrons. John Rich, a London theatre impresario, caught this shift in taste and from 1715 introduced light stage entertainment and comic masks designed to compete with opera and the strictly classical. John Gay, who lived from 1685 to 1732, dramatist and poet, was writing for the stage about 1712 and had probably honed his skills and could judge his audience when his masterpiece was launched. The Beggar's Opera opened on the 29th of January 1728 in Lincoln's Inn Fields and ran for an exceptional 63 nights. Part political drama, part moral drama, it also mocked the conventions of Italian Baroque opera. Gay's witty and highly satirical play involved the romantic and financial traits of a highwayman and was fitted to music chosen from popular songs of the day. The Walpole era in British politics, with its extensive venality, provided the occasion for contemporary satire. Britain's first Prime, Min Prime Minister, Sir Robert Walpole, governed fairly continuously between 1721 and 1742 and was savaged by Swift, Pope and Fielding as well as Gay who all contributed magnificently to English literature's satirical canon. Gay cut through the intricacies of contemporary political life with its power struggles, factions and shifting alliances by representing Walpole in his satire as an impresario of larceny and receiver of stolen goods. If the bagpipe did indeed play a part in the unmasking of political corruption, it might be judged as raising rather 
as raising rather than lowering, lowering the vision, as sonata rather than scatology, in that the satire offered a moral corrective issuing from the popular and the pastoral. The theme of the pastoral in the Baroque supplied variations to suit the tastes of different cultures and political worlds. Okay, so now we're kind of getting on in time a little bit, like we're over an hour, but I just, seeing as we're on, we're on the topic of this Beggar's Opera, so I think we should just finish off what it says about the Beggar's Opera. Um, the music of the Beggar's Opera ranged from the street song and the repertoire of the ballad singer and all familiar and popular songs to simple melodies. The libretto was arranged with accompaniment for a small orchestra and the bagpipes may have been introduced to heighten the burlesque if, for example, the graphic evidence of an anonymous drawing of about 1728 formally attributed to William Hogwarts may be re relied on. The Beggar's Opera burlesqued showed the opera being performed at a fair with ballad sheets on the wall to the left and a gallows in the background. The orchestra of rude instruments consists of a dulcimer, a home drum, which was a bladder on a bowstring, a salt box and a bagpipe. From a musicological perspective, it may be claimed that the artist might have not represented the piper as he did without having seen such a figure himself. It seems to be the first credible representation of the pastoral pipe and in a telling context and could set a date for the pastoral pipe described above. John Gay took the beggar's opera song airs from printed sources such as Thomas Dufresne's Wit and Mirth or Pills to Purge Melancholy rather than directly from traditional folk songs. The study or collecting of which in England had not yet begun. But the instant success of ballad opera in induced a significant change of fashion, including the collection and arrangement of folk songs for concert performance and arguably the development of an instrument for the performer. Performance and collection, demand and supply, fruitfully fed off each other. Dufre had published six volumes of Wit and Mirth by 1720 and Gay had a set of these volumes and drew directly on them. Songs drawn from Wit and Mirth for the Beggar's Opera were well known as Scottish, such as My Mither Says I Money and The Wind Has Blown My Played Away. Other popular Scottish folk songs derived from William Thompson's Orpheus Caledonius Popular airs such as O oh, the Broom, alternatively The Broom of Cowdenells, and The Lass O oh, Patty's Mill, and it has been claimed realistically that Gay must have had a copy of this work. With a collection of 50 songs set for voice and continuo, it was published in London in 1726 by the singer and teacher William Thompson under the classical title playing to the appeal of Purcell's Orpheus Britannicus, which placed Scottish music and song centre stage in the pastoral and appeal, appealed to the London as well as Scottish public. The list of 498 subscribers in the 1733 edition offers impressive testimony to the contemporary popularity of Scottish music and song among nobility and gentry and even spread oh the even spread of this appeal throughout England as well as Scotland and the independent exercise of female taste. The numbers of husband and wife subscribers, each in some instances taking multiples of sets, are significant details. So I think we'll wrap up part two there um, for the time being. I'm going to go over some of those aforementioned tunes and if I come across any kind of nice ones or ones that stick out in my head, I'll include them in uh, part three. So that's the end of part two. Thanks uh, for listening and I'll talk to you again soon in part three where we get on to a, a piece called Edinburgh Town. Thanks.